welcome everybody. Again, my name is Cindy Katz. I'm the Development Coordinator for Montreal at Crohn's and Calais Canada, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our third annual Crohn's and Calais Canada Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium for teens, young adults, and caregivers affected by inflammatory bowel disease. So before we get started uh, and meet the moderators for today's event, I'd just like to go through some technical logistics. The event is being offered in English with live simultaneous French interpretation from BG Communications. If you would like to listen in French, please select the interpretation icon, the globe, in the Zoom menu bar and select French from the list. If you experience any technical problems during the event, please try refreshing your website browser or relaunching the Zoom meeting. You can also comment in the chat box and we will follow up directly with you. So the Power of You is the first of four events in the series made possible from the support of the Jacqueline Fisher Foundation. Education, registration is now open. Join us for part two of the Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium series next Sunday, November 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our distinguished panel of registered dietitians with La live experience with lived experience of IBD will dig deep into diet and nutrition that focuses around strategies for you to manage your diet, including trigger foods, meal planning, eating on a budget, and so much more. To register, you can scan for the QR code on your phone that's indicated on the slide or visit cronesandcolitiscanada.ca slash Jacqueline Fisher. Now we're ready to get started with today's event. To begin, it's my pleasure to introduce Rena Fisher from the Jacqueline Fisher Foundation. He, uh, this event is in honor of her daughter, Jacqueline Fisher. Please join me in welcoming Rena. Rena? Yes, hi. Um, I don't think I'm muted. Go ahead. Um, so it, it's my honor to be here today to speak on behalf uh, of the foundation, uh, Jackie's foundation on behalf of my daughter, Jackie, um, who would have been uh, very excited to, to participate in something like this um, in, in, her, um, in her day. Uh, Jackie was diagnosed with Crohn's uh, disease, uh, moderate Crohn's disease at the age of nine that got um, very severe as the years went by. Uh, so she was very young. She was like many of you, I'm assuming, in, in elementary school when she was first diagnosed and we didn't know what hit us as a family. Um, and um, so it was quite an adjustment. Uh, Jackie was on all kinds of medications that prevented her from going to school for many, many months. Um, uh, and that uh, made us realize, made her realize that no one really understands why she had terrific support from her friends and all, but nobody really knew what this was any more than we did. So Jackie really became um, a leader. It was very empowering for her, excuse me, <clears throat> to, um, to advocate for herself and for the disease. Uh, and that for her meant uh, talking to her teachers, talking to the administration, talking to her fellow students. And from there on, at any level of um, education of schooling that Jackie went through, uh, especially at high school, she um, created a committee for IBD. She uh, did fundraisers for the Crohn's Colitis Foundation of, of uh, Montreal. We as a family started organizing with the help of her um, uh, GI, um, her doctor, um, a gala um, for fundraising and, um, and, and on and on. Jackie then represented, was the youth, I, I'm not sure what you call it, but the youth uh, advocate or representative for the Gutsy Walk, I think it's called now, uh, the heel and wheel at the time. Uh, that was in 2006, and so she was a young teen. Um, she then uh, was chosen, actually was so proud to have been chosen to represent Quebec on the National Youth Council that no longer exists for Crohn's Colitis within the Crohn's Colitis Foundation. Uh, it doesn't exist and we're really hoping that it will be resurrected. 
um, and so became a, a real um, leader who wanted to spread the word and was not embarrassed. I think this really fits in with today's theme of be yourself. Uh, she was not embarrassed to talk about the various aspects of the disease from poop to pain, which was her main, main uh, symptom for Jackie was pain. Um, but uh, she would talk to anybody about any of it um, and, um, and, and really did uh, very well until she got um, cancer after many years of being on all kinds of very heavy duty uh, medications and biologics and such. Uh, so at 21 in university, second year university, um, she got diagnosed and, um, and there was another bomb that, that fell on us. It was not colon cancer. Jackie had primary peritoneal cancer. Um, if, yeah, if anybody knows what that is. Um, but that really hit hard again and uh, required another adjustment in Jackie's life and uh, was very difficult. And after four years of struggling with, with uh, cancer and four surgeries, uh, heavy duty surgeries uh, and long recoveries and chemotherapy and all of that, uh, Jackie finally passed away, um, passed over, I should say, or, or died in um, 2015. And uh, before um, leaving us, we had talked a lot about um, um, doing more to help um, people with Crohn's colitis, with cancer, a sick population, uh, people who are newly diagnosed and such. And so the foundation, with the help of the gala committee, we owe them our, our gratitude, uh, the ladies um, of the uh, gala committee in Montreal, who helped establish this endowment fund in Jackie's memory that we hope will move forward for many, many years to, to create all kinds of wonderful educational events, not just the yearly symposia that we are devoted to, but um, uh, support for any of you who might want to go out to the high schools and create committees and, and um, education and, and whatnot. We, we're there um, at Jackie's Foundation and through the Endowment Fund of Cross Colitis to support you with funds, with materials, with whatever it is that you need. So um, stay strong and safe, especially during these pandemic times and enjoy this symposium that was correct, uh, created for you. And thank you, uh, really heartfelt thanks to Cindy and Catherine and uh, the Toronto team who um, uh, head office who, who have really uh, worked so hard to, to pull this together. We are very appreciative. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Rena, and thank you so much to the Jacqueline Fisher Foundation, Foundation for your support. And um, this, uh, now I'd like to introduce you to, um, I'm so excited to introduce you to the members of the Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, Youth Advisory Committee, who will be co-moderating the Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium events the next four weeks, today and the next three weeks. So please join me in welcoming Mia, Cal, Brianna and Evan. Hi everyone, my name is Mia. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2017. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, with Crohn's and Colitis Canada and I was honorary chair for Good to Walk in 2020. Hello, I'm Evan Gotro uh, and I am 15 years old. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 10. Uh, since then I've been volunteering with Crohn's and Colitis Canada and was an honorary chair for the Gutsy Walk in 2019. Uh, Cal Spellman uh, will also be joining us later on. Uh, he's 17 years old and from Ontario. Uh, he was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2015, and he has been volunteering with Crohn's and Colitis Canada for the last four years. Okay, uh, I guess Brianna. So thank you, Mia and Evan. Um, I hope Cal will be joining us later. So thank you all for your support and volunteering with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Please take it away. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome our first panel member, Chantelle Wicks, to share her journey of living with IVD with us all today. 
Uh, Chantelle is an IVD warrior who's been battling IVD, IVD now for over 14 years. She's the host of the podcast Guts and Glory that explores all things IVD by interviewing patients, medical professionals, researchers, caregivers, organizations, etc. Her goal with the Guts and Glory podcast is to let other IVD warriors know that they are not alone on this journey. In her spare time, she volunteers with the Durham region in Ontario, uh, or the Ontario chapter of Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and is the chair of the Durham region Gutsy Walk. During the day, she's a grade eight teacher for the Toronto District School Board. Please join me in welcoming Chantel. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are in the region. Uh, just to give you a little bit more background about me and my journey with IBD. Um, so I was diagnosed at the age of 20. So I was right in the middle of university. I had just left uh, high school. Um, my journey in the last 14 years has been a difficult one. Um, I've been on multiple medications from um, 5-ASAs to steroids, immunosuppressants. I'm currently on my second biologic. Um, I've had over 25 hospital stays in the last 14 years, so it's definitely um, been quite a journey. Um, my biggest thing for being an IBD warrior, because that's what many of us are here today, is that we need to focus on, you know, for me, I want to focus on advocating and spreading awareness. And I heard uh, Mrs. Fisher mention that was something that uh, Jacqueline really focused on and what she became an advocate for. So I volunteer a lot of my time with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Um, in the past, I've done some events where I've been a Canadian advisor for a Marvel comic that was actually written about people with IBD. So there's a graphic novel that exists about that, which is pretty cool. I've been able to speak at public events. I've been on news and radio and TV. And for me, it's growing that confidence in myself and not being overwhelmed um, or feeling like I'm not good enough or feeling that this disease is controlling me. For me, it's been, let's learn as much as I can about my disease. Let's do the best that I can to stay well, advocate as much as I can. And when I do have a tough time, because tough times do come, um, you know, persevere through it um, and then just stay positive and know that good, better times are ahead. Uh, in the last 14 years, I've also started the podcast, as Evan mentioned. So I have a podcast called Guts and Glory. Um, so if you don't know what a podcast is, it's kind of like an Internet radio show, sort of. Uh, so we, I have a podcast where um, I interview lots of people, people, uh, kids have been on my podcast and doctors and university students and scientists and, you know, parents of people with IBD. And we just kind of talk about what it's like, because sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, this disease makes you feel alone. Uh, and it's, it's helpful for me to hear what other people have to say. And it's helpful for our listeners to know that they're not alone in this journey and that there are other people who are battling IBD as well. Um, I love to travel, so I don't let my IBD keep me down. COVID has, though, not traveling with COVID. Uh, but I do love to travel. Um, I love to have new experiences and try new things. Um, I love to stay active whenever I have the right amount of energy to do so. And my motto in life, especially since I've been diagnosed with IBD, is to have strength and positive thoughts. Thank you so much, Chantal, for your openness and sharing your story of living with IBD with everyone today and all the work you do in helping to raise aware awareness about Crohn's and colitis. Our next panel member to share their journey with IBD is Brady Elchitz. Brady has lived experience with IBD and is a Crohn's and colitis Canada youth leader in Alberta and British Columbia. He is a grade 12 student at Henry Wisewood High School in Calgary. As a volleyball athlete, Brady spends most of his time on the court developing his skills for post-secondary volleyball. Brady was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 11 and is committed to sharing his personal experience with other youth who have been diagnosed with IBD. Please join me in welcoming Brady. Uh, hi everyone, thank you all for coming. Um, as Mia said, I am a I am a grade 12 student at Henry Wisewood. And my, my Crohn's experience is more of a rocky but expected start. So um, I, I was diagnosed in um, 2015 at the age of 11. And it was pretty much guaranteed for me to have Crohn's because um, my mom um, has Crohn's and both sides of her family 
do at least three people on each side. So it was like a guaranteed shot for me to get it. Um, when I was, I was diagnosed with Crohn's, I went on prednisone for six months. And I will say that the prednisone was awful. I had to have apple juice with it because I think most of you know that it tastes awful. Um, and then um, after that, the doctors put me on Remicade. I was in the IV and I had to miss some school over, um, over for about six months. I had an IV every eight weeks until I had a reaction and my, um, I had trouble with my breathing and I started getting rashes and they did not hesitate to take me off. Um, and after that, I transitioned to uh, Humira and um, I started on a syringe um, but over time, I wanted to be able to, um, I wanted to be able to take my medication with me so I could still travel and not have to worry about taking a syringe and having someone stick it in my thigh. Um, I, um, I, um, so I moved to an auto injector and I have been using that for the past six, five years. Yeah, five years. Um, I am a, uh, I am an athlete and I have always loved to, um, um, I, I'm always active. I've done volleyball. I've done badminton. I've done basketball. I've done track and field. Um, I've done soccer. Um, I have done so much and I love going to school and just learning and, um, it is, and both of those have, um, allowed me to want, sorry, um, a, a lot of those have, um, allowed me to um, pursue my, uh, my idea of what I want to do for, uh, not only post-secondary volleyball, but, um, I also want to do kinesiology and, um, and with all that, I have been able to keep control of my Crohn's, whether it's keeping a strong diet or, um, just making sure it's always a wash nearby. But, um, yeah, I, um, I, as, um, as I became more of an athlete, I wanted to become an example for others um, to show that you can do anything with Crohn's and colitis and it should never, it should never really hold you back. Um, and uh, my goal is to continue building confidence in, um, in not only just talking about my disease, but in helping others um, in order to um, understand the disease further and to be able to open up to um, friends or family or whoever it is with no worry because, um, because we're all one strong community. Thanks, Brady, for being here today and to share your story of living with IBD with everyone and the support you provide to other youth that are going through this journey. Our next panel member to share their journey with IBD is Sandra Zelensky. Sandra has been living a uh, life with Crohn's disease for 28 years. She was 19 years old when she realized the importance of seeking out good information, learning about her disease and being a strong advocate in her care. She is passionate about her work as a patient engagement researcher with focuses on bringing the, import the important patient and family experiences, perspectives and insights into health research to help inform and develop patient-centric ap approaches with IBD care. Sandra has completed the Digital Storytelling Facilitator Program at the Story Center in Berkeley, California, and she loves to use creative art-based approaches in her work. Through national and international speaking engagements, she shares the importance of involving patients as partners in, care, in their care. In health research and healthcare improvements, Sarah is also a member of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's COVID-19 Task Force. Please join me in welcoming Sandra. Thanks, Mia. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, and thanks for inviting me to be here, uh, Sarah, and Crohn's and Colitis Canada. It is a real uh, privilege and honor to be at this event. Um, and Rena, thanks so much for your opening remarks. Um, so I would like to share a little bit about my journey, which <laughs> is long. I'm the oldest one here and have been living with it for a very long time. I was diagnosed at the age of 19 years old. 
Um, I probably had it for a little while before then, probably lived with it since I was 17 um, and just sort of was in and out of healthcare trying to figure out what was going on with me at that time. And then received an official diagnosis at the age of 19. And the reason why in my, um, uh, Mia sort of said in the opening remarks, why I learned at a very young age, the importance of um, sort of learning as much as I could about my illness. And so about living with Crohn's disease and the different medications and all that kind of stuff is because I had a funny situation when I was diagnosed where um, my family doctor told me that um, we think you have Crohn's disease, but we're not going to tell you what that is. And I left the office alone and scared. And at the time, this is how old I am. <laughs> There was no uh, smartphones, and I ran to a local public library to look up what is Crohn's disease. And so that was my first touch point of figuring out um, that I had this chronic disease. I didn't know what it meant for me, and really trying to learn more about um, that. And I, by the way, switched family doctors and found someone really great who I could work with and who would actually share information and answer questions. And for me, that was very important. So I've had a long, um, tough journey, but also with successes throughout um, the years of living with Crohn's disease. I've had a lot of complications. I've had four surgeries, um, fistulizing Crohn's disease. I've experienced a lot of the different things that come along with living with IBD. At the age of 26, um, I went in for an emergency surgery because I was very, very ill and um, came out with a permanent ileostomy, which actually um, improved the, my quality of life tremendously. Um, and I was scared going into that surgery of um, sort of having this thing on my body and living with that. But afterwards, um, after having the surgery and recovering from my surgery, it changed my life tremendously. And actually it was a life saving surgery. So I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for having the ileostomy and um, I'm obviously have learned to manage and live well with it. Um, I have had just as Brady and Chantel were saying earlier, been on many different medications and was, um, in a time when biologics weren't an option early on in my diagnosis. And so I really struggled a lot through the first eight years of living with Crohn's disease. And then biologics came along and I got on to my first biologic and it really worked well for me. I was very fortunate not having a lot of side effects and actually helping me to be in remission for the first time in eight or nine years. I am now currently on my third biologic um, knock on wood, that one is working well as well. So um, that helps to maintain uh, quality of life. I do have other things that I deal with because of having four surgeries and having to sort of manage, you know, a quicker transit time and these different things that come with having bowel removed. But my main message for everyone today is, and I sort of was reflecting on this as we were preparing for today's session, is that even though there's been a lot of challenges and struggles, um, I also see that I've had a lot of good times through my life of living with Crohn's disease. And this is why I also chose to share some pictures of me sort of doing the things that I love to do, because again, too, as Brady said, so I was an athlete growing up, loved all sports and really continued to do that. Um, and then now focus more time on spending time in the outdoors. I do big backpacking, hiking trips with an ileostomy in the outdoors. I'll spend four or five days out there, change my ileostomy out there, um, do, you know, 15 to 20 kilometer day hikes in the mountains. Um, we go out fishing. So there's always ways to adapt and sort of figure out how to manage things so that it best suits you. And so I just really want to provide that message of hope as well, that yes, we go through challenging times. It's very normal to feel anxious and sometimes low while you're in those times, but there's also a lot of good that comes. And I also do believe that people that live with chronic disease, and I'm sure as you all know, um, I think we develop skill sets that um, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily if you weren't. So 
things like being empathetic towards others and knowing what it's like to live um, with some with the struggle and and sort of being more open and understanding of other people around us. And I think we do sort of develop some of those skills early on, especially because a lot of us are diagnosed um, at such a young age. So I just wanted to leave you all with that message of hope and hopefully that you don't um, sort of let your disease get in the way of your hopes and dreams and that you're able obviously too, to find um, remission through medications and different treatment options that are available um, in discussion with your care providers. So thank you so much. And um, we look forward to chatting with you today. Thank you very much, Sandra, for joining us all today to share your experiences of living with IBD and your passion for supporting others affected by Crohn's colitis. Our fantastic panel members will now discuss some of the challenges of living with IBD and offer tips and advice based on their knowledge and experiences of living with Crohn's or colitis. They will also be answering questions that were submitted by some of you when you registered for the event. We invite you to comment and ask questions during this panel discussion using the chat box in the Zoom menu bar. But before we hear from uh, the panel, we'd like to do a poll to ask you all, what are some challenges you face living with IBD? To enter the poll, please enter the URL into your web browser or scan the QR code on the screen using your mobile phone. You can type in your responses using one word or short phrases. Um, Okay, I'm starting to see some answers. All right. So um, thanks everyone for submitting your responses. And now I'll ask Sandra and the rest of the panel to share some of their thoughts on this topic. I can start if you want and then pass the baton over to Brady and Chantel. Of course. Um, so just even looking at all of the items that are coming up on um, the poll, I think I could relate to everything that's um, standing out so far with pain and stigma, anxiety. And I think a lot of these are, are really normal things to experience and go through. Um, you know, I think especially when we're not well and are um, perhaps trying to figure out a solution to make things better and we're looking to figure out diet and what can help us and those anxieties of having to plan out our trips so even if you're just sort of going from home to school or home to work or whatever and having to sort of figure out where are the bathrooms along the way if I need to stop and use a washroom and so I think all of these things that are um, coming up I can relate to um, and have had all of these things at different times. Sometimes some things um, that I'm experiencing, so pain, for example, um, are more prevalent. And then other times I'm, you know, struggling with something else and maybe not pain. So I think it's, that's the thing with a chronic illness. It's really kind of this ebb and flow. It's not sort of this, you know, ladder where you kind of just get better and, and um, you know, everything's good to go. So I think we sort of have to learn how to adjust to those ups and downs and going through these different things. And then I'll just pass it on to Chantal or Brady. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, so I, um, 
for me, what relates most is um, the like uh, um, from the poll is the bathroom, sports, and the pain. Uh, because um, because you've um, like like most of you know, whenever um, if you have IBD, you need to have a washroom by at all times. Like whether you just eaten or not, like it just it's it's something you always keep in the back of your head, and. Um, it's definitely like it at first. It definitely affected um, my ability to um, do activities that I wanted to. Like I couldn't, um, um, I couldn't go on long. Um, I couldn't really like go um, play sports for a really long period of time because, or I couldn't eat a whole bunch. Like you need to have a certain diet or a plan. Um, I did um, having um, uh, my mom was a dietitian so um having her as a dietitian definitely helped with that and it allowed me to still be able to go on um, adventures and um like and with with sports it was very sometimes it's very difficult because you'd have like for me one of my triggers is dairy and i'd have a little bit of dairy and then it's just um i'd have like it would be pretty hard to do sports after that I'll say that. Um, and yeah, it's, um, but like one of the main ways that I overcame um, that was just to be able to, um, was just to be able to like think, um, think in the back of my head, like how can I beat this? And that's what I did. Uh, and I'll pass on to uh, Chantel. Uh Okay, so the first thing I want to say when it comes to challenges and anxieties with your IBD, um, they are completely normal. There is nothing wrong with you. Uh, that's the first message I want to make sure that you totally hear and understand. It is okay to feel uncomfortable. It is okay to have some anxiety. It's okay to be dealing with, um, you know, feeling embarrassed or having awkward conversations. We have all felt that way, even myself. And I now talk about my IBD and going to the bathroom and everything that's associated with, uh, with anybody in my life. I have no fear anymore. I have no anxiety, but I absolutely felt uncomfortable at the beginning, for sure. So um, some of the challenges or anxieties that, you know, Brady and, and Sandra and I spoke about, you can see them on the screen, you know, having those awkward conversations, right? How do you tell your best friend that you have this disease? Or how do you tell your best friend you need to get to the bathroom really quickly? Um, you know, the fear of being judged, you're afraid that you're, you know, people will make fun of you or that they'll think you're different or weird, um, you know. When you when you go to public events, like Brady mentioned, like you want to make sure you know where the bathroom is all the time, especially if your disease is active at the time, um, you know, worrying about that embarrassment. And then, of course, one of the things that you'll notice is unlike some other diseases um, that we hear about on a regular basis, IBD, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, isn't something that a lot of people know about. And I think that's what makes the, our, our, the, one of our biggest challenges even harder, because when we mention that we have a disease and people don't know what that disease is, you know, the fact that they don't have an understanding of it um, or if what they know about it is very limited really makes our, your job as someone with IBD a little bit more difficult because then that means we have to educate them. We have to let them know what this means so that they understand. So those are just some of the challenges and anxieties. And I don't know if Sandra or Brady, if you wanted to add in something else about our thought bubbles here. I'll add one more um, comment. I think um, that's really important. I think, you know, to as, as much as or as best as possible to try to learn as much as you can and get as much information, good information about IBD, and then also just understanding how um, that sort of transpires within your own body and understanding your own disease. And th that information can really help you with communicating information to others. And there's different, you know, we all have different personalities. So I think there's also different strategies. Like I have tend to use a lot of humor to kind of diffuse that awkwardness that can happen at times. Um, yeah, and I just, I think um, 
just one other little piece of information I would love to sort of leave with you guys is that in my experience, and I'm not saying that there's nobody that's going to have a kind of a negative reaction, but I think overall, most people um, are pretty good when you share the information or are able to share, you know, um, what Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis is and what the, what that's like for you, that most people actually have a fairly positive and supportive response. I haven't had a lot of people really respond in a negative way or in a way that made me feel bad for having IBD. So I think, um, and, and I also early on, like when I was very young at, at 1920, I also decided that if somebody is going to be that way, like where they um, aren't going to like me for some reason for having IBD, then maybe they're not the best people to have in my life. So I kind of also created that narrative where it's like, well, maybe they're not the greatest person. And maybe those aren't the people that I want around me anyways. So that was kind of also a little strategy that I used to sort of build that confidence around, um, you know, living with a chronic disease at such a young age, especially. Brady, did you want to add anything else? Uh, yeah, like, I, I kind of just want to add, like, on to what you said about the, um, about what Sandra said about, um, how people don't really take Crohn's or Clarice negatively. Like, I, like, obviously, I have way less experience than because I'm, like, I don't even know how many years younger. Um, uh, just, I'll, I'll just say a few. Um, but, like, um, like, Crohn's is not really, or for me, it's Crohn's, but Crohn's or colitis, I have not found that it's really a disease to like make fun, um, to make fun of. Like you could have, you could have jokes with your friends, but I've never actually um, seen or heard of someone take Crohn's negatively in a way that um, is like, oh, you have Crohn's, I'm not going to hang out with you or stuff like that. Like it's, and I feel that that helped that helped me so much with um, just opening up and being able to talk to my friends and family about my disease. Brady, I'm the same age as your mom. Just so you know, where our birthdays are like two days apart. So. Oh no! I know. You want to know I, I, I just, how I many? I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Okay, thanks Chantal, Brady, and Sandra for sharing some of the challenges you've experienced with living with IBD and your advice for the group to help with those challenges. Um, our next question for you is, uh, what are some ways in which you are already involved with the IBD community or how would you like to get involved? To answer, please ask the first question, uh, enter the URL into your web browser or scan the QR code on the screen um, using your phone. Perfect. Um, so um, I asked Chantel and the rest of the panel to share some of their thoughts on um, the answers submitted for this question. Absolutely. Um, so I'll start. It's good to see that a lot of you are actually writing some of the things that we thought about as well that Brady and Sandra and I spoke about. So like a lot of you, volunteering with um, organizations like Crohn's and Colitis Canada, for example, or even just volunteering within your school community, whether that be high school or post-secondary education, um, just to kind of help spread that awareness is really, really great. I noticed that there was Betsy Walk on there, which is something that we talked about too. 
I remember my very first gutsy walk. Uh, I was actually the honorary chair. I think Mia mentioned she was the honorary chair for last year's gutsy walk. So um, I was the honorary chair and, you know, I gave a speech about living with IBD and then being at the gutsy walk and meeting other people face to face uh, who had IBD for me. That was some of the, that was one of my first experiences of meeting other people in real life with IBD. And that was super helpful for me. Um, it also gives you extra knowledge about your disease. And both Sandra and Brady had mentioned, you know, the more you know about your disease, uh, the better you're going to be at um, moving forward about explaining it to other people, having conversations with your doctors, understanding what's happening to your body. Um, I noticed that some, you mentioned the camp. So I'm assuming some of you have been to camp got to go, which is pretty fantastic. Good for you guys. If you've been there, remember to keep signing up. Um, also some other ways that you can get involved and connected, um, you know, with the IBD community, there are some online platforms like, you know, through social media. So Crohn's and Colitis Canada has a peer support program as well. I think that's for 18 and older right now. Um, but there are also other organizations and, you know, depending on your age, you may have had some conversations in school about, uh, reliable, safe so, uh, sources and where you should be going. So I'm going to use my, my teacher voice right now and remind you all that you want to make sure that you're very careful of what you're viewing online. Um, you know, make sure it's a reputable website. So really good websites to use. Obviously, Crohn's and Colitis Canada has a lot of great resources on there, plus links to other resources that are very helpful for you. There's also another organization called badgot.org. And on social media, you may be able to find other people just like you who are using the has hashtag Crohn's or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or colitis or IBD. And a lot of people have found um, that just following other people's stories who are comfortable uh, sharing their IBD journey has really helped uh, to allow them to get connected. So I'll, I'll let some other people, either Brady or Sandra, add some more things in. Maybe even we'll start with Brady, considering he's kind of like a few a few years younger than us, as he said. So. Yeah. Um, um, so I have um, I have I've done volunteering for Crohn's and Colitis and over for me over the past year, I have um, I've been working with my uh, with my Crohn's and Colitis chapter in Calgary. And um, just recently, actually, we started last month. Um, we started doing uh, youth, um, like youth groups, like um, just like meetings to be able um, to have a community or have people that you can talk to. Whether it's right now, it's online, but um, it is very. Um, um, it's just it, like I found that it's so important to be able, especially as a kid to be able to relate to people with IBD because, um, because um, a lot of times you don't really know what your body is going through and it really helps to be able to just talk with people about it and to be able to learn and understand it more. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've done that. And I've also, um, uh, I've also done some stuff related to, um, isn't as much related to IBD but when I was in grade seven or eight, I took part in Beads of Courage and I had, which is where you go to the hospital and you, um, you get certain beads for stuff you do. So you get pokes, um, you get black beads and you get, um, you have like birthday beads and all that. And I, after two years, I had a necklace all the way down, like to my feet, probably even more. And I, and I created a bunch of beads and I got, and I involved my entire class, um, which was only like 10 people because I went to a private school, but um, it was, it was still very, um, it was very just helpful. And it was, um, it, it, it was very like, can't find a word. Um, um, like, like I was very enthusiastic about it because I was able to give back to people. And that, that is especially for me, with um, like getting involved and connecting with others. Um, I wanna make sure that they have all the access, um, like everything that they need in order to have the, have the best life with IBD. And now I think Sandra is gonna speak. 
Thanks. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, I would like to reiterate the, the peer to peer. And so I've made connections in a very different way, but having those friendships with other people that live with IBD, um, it's just a completely different experience where you don't have to explain some of the nuances and even sometimes a sense of humor where you can joke around about things and the person's not like mortified about what you're joking about. They just get it. Um, and they just get the, you know, the, the struggles and the challenges. And so it's nice not having to really sort of, um, have somebody look at you like, Oh, what? I don't, I don't understand that. And having that real, um, connection, I guess, with somebody else who really does get it. And it's really, you know, it's really, uh, I really do believe that nobody really knows unless they've lived through, um, what it's like to live with, you know, whatever chronic disease, but with inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Um, yeah. And I think basically Brady and Chantel have covered a lot of ways to, um, you know, sort of connect within the community, find others, um, that live with it. Um, you know, to Chantel's point around the social media, um, if you do sort of follow some people who share their story more broadly, sometimes, you know, even sending a direct message or something like that, you can start developing um, some of those connections online as well, where, you know, you can sort of have those private conversations too. Um, but to that point too, just being careful on social media and sort of, um, you know, really thinking about who's saying what, um, we know there's trolls that go in there and say all kinds of things as well. And it's just open to everyone. So I think it's finding those people that really are living with it and trying to connect also one-on-one -on -one with some individuals, if that's possible. And those things can happen also like in camp for teens. Um, I know we have some older, um, some people that are in their early twenties here. So, you know, um, there might be other ways to, um, connect with others. And then I do see a couple um, comments, Rachel, that you've um, asked in the uh, chat box. I see one for Brady. And then I'm also, I'll just quickly talk a little bit about dealing with like bosses or teachers and then flip it to Chantel, who, who um, uh, can talk a little bit more. I think we all have different coping strategies. Um, I guess in an ideal world, it would be nice to have um, support, uh, with, you know, just, uh, what's uh, like just that supportive environment where, um, employers or teachers or everyone understands, but sometimes it's not what happens. And, um, I have found in my own personal experience, I've made decisions based on kind of getting a feel for the person, whether or not I'm even going to share that information or whether I'm just going to deal with it and not let say an employer know, that might not be the best. And hopefully we're moving towards a space that's more inclusive and more understanding um, of people living with all kinds of different things. But um, yeah, I guess in my own experience, I've, uh, there have been times where I've felt that I have to sort of protect or not share certain things about my health for, for my own fear of being judged. Um, but generally, I have been fairly open. I don't normally maybe disclose it at a job interview, but then we'll share it once, um, you know, we start working and, and people need to understand maybe why you're getting up to go to the bathroom a little bit more frequently, etc. cetera. Um, and then maybe Brady and Chantel can speak a little bit more to those uh, questions. Okay, so um... One of the things I just wanted to say, you know, the question that's on the screen right now, uh, it says, what are some ways to get involved and connect with others living with IBD? So the one thing I want to mention is that getting connected and getting involved um, looks very different depending on where you are in your understanding of your disease. You do not have to be comfortable to share that you have IBD with anybody. Um, that is up to you when you get to that stage in your disease and your understanding of your disease. But I will say the same thing that Brady and Sandra have said, it is good even just to be a part of other, um, you, know, you know, volunteer or go to the gutsy walk or follow people on social media or visit Crohn's and Colitis Canada's website or go to chapter meetings uh, in your province and in your city for that Crohn's and Colitis Canada offers only because that will help to give you the confidence that maybe one day, if you're not ready yet, 
maybe there will become a day where you will be comfortable to share your disease um, more openly without the fear of being discriminated against or, you know, having a stigma associated to you. So when it comes to, you know, when you have teachers or bosses who may not understand or are willing to make an accommodation, the first thing I want to say to all of you, regardless of your age, whether you are a student in high school, a student in post-secondary education, or an adult, in Canada, inflammatory bowel disease is considered a disability, and by law, accommodations must be made for you. So do not allow at any point, and I'm telling you this as a teacher, for the from the biggest school board in the country, I teach grade eight, do not allow anyone, whether they are your age, whether they are younger than you, older than you, whether they are in a position of authority over you or not, you have IBD, it is considered a disability, and therefore you are entitled to accommodations that will make you feel more comfortable. And when people tell you otherwise, then you make sure you reach out to the right resources. If you're in high school, reach out to the principal, vice principal, the guidance counselor. If you're in a university or college or, you know, in the workplace, reach out to your human resources department and make sure that you advocate for yourself. Okay. It is not okay. And you are not to stand for that. Okay. Uh, uh, was there anything else you, that you wanted to add? Uh, I don't know if Brady or Sandra had anything else. Oh, I do uh, have a point about university. Sorry, Brady, just one thing. Okay. So for those of you who are in post-secondary education, just want to let you know, uh, university or college or post-secondary edu- edu- um, institution will make accommodations for you, especially when it comes time for exams. So for example, when I was writing one of my exams, instead of being, I went to the University of Toronto in downtown uh, Toronto in Ontario, big university, classes are huge. Uh, when I wrote my exam, I, instead of being in a big exam hall with, you know, a few hundred other people, I was actually in a private room with a bathroom right next door. Uh, obviously somebody was in there as well, monitoring me to make sure I wasn't cheating, of course. Um, but I advocated for myself um, at the, you know, the resource center at the school. Uh, I let them know that I had IBD and these are the accommodations that I need. And they made them with no questions asked. So the other thing, too, I just want to add to this is we can't assume, ladies and gentlemen, that people are going to understand what you're going through until you divulge that information to them. So that becomes, unfortunately, a responsibility of yourself to talk about the fact that you have IBD, to advocate for yourself and the resources that you need to have access to. And then once you tell those people, it is their responsibility to make sure those things happen. And if they don't, you keep following up and following up and following up. Sorry, Brady. Okay, Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about what Rachel said in the chat about um, athletes. And yeah, yeah, like that is true. Like sometimes like, obviously like in Canada like we are like when everyone's very nice and to um like there isn't as much stigma or negative attitudes towards Crohn's or colitis but if that is to happen I I personally have never had that I have always had great coaches and I and I've I've talked I talked to every single one like early on um, that I have, um, I tell them I have Crohn's and sometimes that may mean that I have to, um, leave practice in the middle, um, of a game and, or, or, or I have to leave practice. So I have to leave a game because I had to go to the washroom and uh, just for a little bit. And like, they have all been fine for me, but if that doesn't happen, like the only thing you can, because as, uh, I think, I think it was Sean, Sean that said it, um, that um, Crohn's or colitis is considered a disability um, kind of in Canada. And um, like, they should not be on, um, they, like there's, they're not allowed to say no. And if, if it does become a problem where you are not allowed for something like that, uh, you should talk to whoever is next above the chain. So if it's a teammate, talk to the coach and tell them that, um, tell them that's not something you control um if it's the coach then you talk to um you talk to whoever is um runs the club or something like that like it's 
Um, it's more based, um, but generally I find that, um, I, I find that most people are always welcoming um, for a disease. Yeah. So I just, I would just like to sort of recap that because I think one of the mo more, like the most important messaging around that, that can be one of the hardest things to do is to find your voice and be a strong advocate. And when I think about that, that's, that's in work in, you know, outside work sort of, you know, activities that you might be involved in, but also in your own healthcare. And there's been, I think all of us can speak to that um, idea where we've had to be our own advocates in care as well, where when we know something's not right, or we're not feeling right, right. And maybe there's been times where you're not taken seriously that you have to um, have that confidence in your voice and be the one to say, no, we need to, you know, we need to do something about this. So whatever that area of life is, you can't sort of let somebody else or, or put that on somebody else when you're the person that really has to be the one that's able to communicate what your needs are um, at whatever given times um, of your disease. So obviously too, that will change throughout um, periods of your disease where perhaps if you're in remission, you might not need as many accommodations and then other times where you need more accommodations. And I think it's just really, it can be a really tough thing to learn, especially at a young age of uh, having a strong voice and being an advocate for yourself, but it is so important. And that back to that part around information. So being able to share information with others, but learning um, about it in order to do that um, well. Thank you so much all, uh, Brady, Sandra, and Chantel for, for sharing some ways that you and others can get involved with the community. Um, for our next topic, do you have any advice for learning more about IBD that you can share with the group? Um, Sandra, we'll start, with, we'll start with you. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, and we've talked a little bit about this um, earlier, I think it's really finding um, trusted, re reliable sources. So you can go to websites like Crohn's Close Canada, Chantal mentioned um, Bad Guts. There's also some really great podcast so Chantel has one of them and there's other podcasts out there um, that are either from other people living with IBD and or medical um, so like gastroenterologists that have podcasts that you can listen to um, you know I think uh, from your doctors is a good source so from your all your healthcare providers. So whether you see a gastroenterologist, ask questions, write your questions down before you go into your appointment. Um, if there's stuff that you want to learn about and if, and if it's, you know, often they're crunched for time. So even if they can print something off or send you to websites or anything like that um, to help you learn, um, it could be an IBD nurse who are amazing at sharing information and doing that whole teaching piece. It can be um, you know, if you're part of a sort of a multidisciplinary care team where you have access to a dietitian or psychologist or any of those individuals that are part of your care team that you know that you can rely on them to get good information, you can even ask if it's of interest for um, links to research. For example, if you like the data, if you like that type of information, you can ask the, your care providers to share some of that type of information as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, there's, so also to the, the podcast, there's some people that have really great blogs that are great advocates in the IBD community. Um, internationally. So um, obviously the, the web space is wide open. I can think of a few. So there's, there's a the girl by the name of Chronically Jess. She posts great information on her blog. Um, there's, there's just so many like areas where you could go and sort of connect on that peer to peer, but where they're also providing good kind of evidence-based information along with sharing a personal um, their own personal story to help contextualize uh, and contextualize that. Um, education events and webinars. So as you all know, Crohn's and Clitus holds these um, webinars regularly. 
And pre-COVID, and hopefully we get there again someday, um, a lot of the academic institutes um, or IBD clinics around, uh, or sorry, across Canada, also will hold their own in-person events where they'll invite um, several uh, care providers. So it could be um, a couple of gastroenterologists, it could be a dietitian that really share different aspects of living with and how to manage IBD. Um, and they, they'll go into technical details. So for example, I know there's a doctor in um, Calgary who's done um, a whole session on, uh, on learning about uh, disease monitoring. And so what the different tests do. So if you get sent for an MRI, what are they looking for? And what do they see? If you get sent for an ultrasound, what are they looking for? What do they see? And so you can start to understand why you're being sent for different tests because you, you receive different information from those tests. So I think there's, you know, many ways connecting with others, um, going to uh, camps, because again, you're learning from other people's experiences, which help to take you out of your bubble. And sometimes that can, you know, be a struggle where if you're feeling like you're on your own, just to get you out of that bubble and start talking to others about it. And I'll just flip it over to whoever would like to go next. So my biggest piece of advice when it comes to learning about your IBD, other than, you know, all the things we've mentioned and things Sandra just said and the things that you see on the screen, um, is that, it, you know, and you may not like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. It is your responsibility to learn about the disease that you have that is inside of your body that as of right now, you will have for the rest of your life. Hopefully not, because we'll find a cure before that. But it is your responsibility to learn about your IBD. And for those of you who are still in pediatric care, so maybe you're under the age of 18, right now, maybe you're taking charge of that, or maybe your caregiver, your parents are taking charge of that. Um, but when you do that transition into adult care, uh, you know, you want to be ready for that. And if you're already in adult care or if you are an adult that was diagnosed like myself at 20, um, I will be honest and say that for the first four, three or four years of my disease, I lived very much in the dark. I didn't really know about IBD. I didn't research about IBD. I didn't really understand what was happening to my body. I went to the doctor's. Uh, I listened to what they said. I took the prescription. I left. I went to the drugstore. I got the medication I needed. I took it when they told me. And that's about it. That's about the extent of what I did. Um, and you know what? I started to feel a lot better about myself, mental health, physical health, emotional health. When I actually started to make, I made the conscious decision to start learning about, about IBD. I wanted to learn about what was IBD. Everything that I could learn, I wanted to learn. When I went to the doctors, I know Sandra mentioned, I went in with questions written down. And when the doctor gave me an answer, I wrote the answers down on a piece of paper so that I had them and I wouldn't forget. And if I didn't understand something, I said, can you say that again? Okay. So what's really important when it comes to learning about your IBD is, you know what, I'll be honest. Yeah, it does suck that we've been diagnosed with IBD, but IBD has given me so many positive experiences in my life. So I am grateful for that. Um, but now that you have IBD, you've got your diagnosis. It's your responsibility to learn as much as you can. And I promise you, you will feel better the more you learn about your disease and it will make you more comfortable with yourself, with your body and with those of people that are around you. Brady, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah. So with, um, for me, I wasn't really like, I, I had feelings that was kind of involved, but I didn't really get involved until probably last year. Um, when I started coming to uh, chapter meetings at, um, um, for uh, the Calgary chapter meetings. And I will say that that just opened my perspective way more. And it definitely helped me in, to be able to understand. So one, one of the things I recommend to everyone out there, especially everyone that, um, that's younger, um, try to get involved earlier because it will help um, so much more in the future, not just with understanding, um, your disease, but also um, being able to um, being able to talk about it and dealing with those um, dealing with all those stresses or anything like that in order to be able to um, in order to be able to uh, live um, live a better life of less worry of 
less worry of what may happen with your with your IBD. And yeah, Chantel and Sandra pretty much said anything else. So. Thank you all for sharing those learning tips. Um, for our next topic, um, do you have any advice for communicating with others about IBD? And why is it important to talk about IBD with our friends, family, and classmates or coworkers? Uh, we'll start with you, Brady. All right, so um, for me, what I, I am an, a very open person, so I like to, um, so I, I, I'm not afraid to talk about my Crohn's with anyone. And um, like, like I have a very supportive friend group and a uh, very supportive family. So right away, like my Crohn's just clicked into uh, like, like, like we made jokes. Like if we have, if we go out for like some type of um, food or um, or if we go out for ice cream, like we make jokes, like, oh, I, oh, I'll have to go to the washroom really fast after this or stuff like that. Just make jokes out of it, make a laugh because, because Crohn's isn't something you should be ashamed of. And I've never seen it as something that I should be ashamed of. And I've never let it hold me back. And, um, yeah, and th that's, that's one of the key takeaways for me is that um IBD is um yeah like sometimes sometimes it sucks but I have just never let it um overcome me and I've always just overcome it and I think that's what um obviously some people don't have the same mindset as me but I think that that is some of the um I think that that is some of the best ways to um to over, um to overcome your disease to talk about and to talk about it and um now i'm going to pass on to sandra yeah i think that you ma you made a really good point around um ibd isn't something to be ashamed about it's something we can't help for one so why you know if you think about that uh, emotion of like either guilt or shame it doesn't it, it doesn't even really make sense where if you're, if you're living with something you can't help, it is what it is. And I feel like just to further that thought, I mean, if, if somebody is kind of reacting funny where you're, you're feeling that way, it's actually more on them than it is on you. That that's their own uncomfortableness. And, you know, you can try to share a little bit of information um, to maybe get them more comfortable or to understand it a little bit better but if there's somebody that's just at this moment in time in their life not going to understand that that's on them not on you and so I think you know just understanding that you know this is something you can't help that there are embarrassing things but um, just to be open about it and it really helps to alleviate those awkward times using humor using you know different strategies to sort of talk about it to sort of lighten the mood around that so as Brady was saying too I, I tend to use a lot of humor because I just find it helps to diffuse an awkward situation that can come up if um, you know you have to go to the bathroom and I've been in situations where it's been super embarrassing because it just like stinks up the whole house or something. I'm at someone's house and I'm like, oh my God. So I come out and I'll make a joke. Just don't go in there for the next hour. <laughs> like we'll probably have to evacuate the house and I'll just make jokes so that people like kind of can laugh. And then, and then it's just out there, right? It's just done. It's, I can't help it. It is what it is. And, and then carry on. And I know that can be um, tough, but it can, I feel like it's almost harder to live um, like uh, embarrassed and quiet and, you know, and so just to be brave, like, and it does take some courage and um, that bravery to sort of step out and just call it like it is, as opposed to just like, oh my God, I'm going to crawl under, you know, the table right now because I'm so embarrassed about this, or I'm just going to leave because this is horrible and I don't want to be in this situation. I think you can really help to diffuse those types of um, things. Um, and I think just, yeah, uh, finding ways to communicate what you live with and, and learning, you know, you, over time you learn people's reactions. And so even learning 
kind of feeling out how much people can take on right now and sort of figuring out how much you're going to share, not letting things like ever, so many people have advice and don't really understand the disease well. So they might tell you oil of oregano is going to cure your disease. Just let it go. Like people have good intentions and want you to be better or really misunderstand um, how serious these diseases can be. And so, you know, if sometimes you just have to smile and let it go. <laughs> and again, you know, the, it's just that lack of a uh, misunderstanding. And, you know, again, you can also, if you feel like maybe that person's open to learning more, you can go down that road or you can just think, okay, now's not the time. Um, I don't think this person's really open to learning and that's okay too. So I think you get a feel for people and you just, and sometimes it's your own mood. Like, I don't feel like going into this and talking about this right now. And that's okay as well. Or sometimes you think, you know what, this is important for them to understand and have a better perspective around this. So go yeah, ahead. One of, one of the things I would say for sure, like I am big with humor. I don't know if you saw one of the pictures that I posted on uh, my slide when I was telling my story, I was sitting on a toilet. There was another picture with me holding a poop emoji. You know, I'm a grade eight teacher. And by the second day of school, all my students know that I have this disease. And sometimes it means I have to go to the bathroom a lot. And they all kind of look at me like, oh my gosh, the teacher just told us that she goes poop a lot. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's a good thing to be open about those things. You might not be there yet, really, if you're, you know, depending on where you are in your stage of dealing with IBD, you might not be there yet, but you'll get there. And, you know, Sandra mentioned, if, there, if I had the same, where I've met some people who they've not been very nice, they've not been very understanding. And you know what? I've told myself, uh, good thing that you've showed me your true colors now, uh, because I don't want you to be in my life anyways, and I've cut them out right? Surround yourself with people who are empathetic and who are understanding. Um, be a good person and you'll attract good people at the same time. You know, that's kind of how I look at it. And I'm big on honesty is the best policy. So whenever you can be honest about your disease and what you're experiencing, you will likely find that there will be other people who will really appreciate you being honest. And let's be perfectly clear. Everybody poops. Everybody has had diarrhea. Everybody's experienced some kind of pain, right? Everybody's had to go to the doctor before. You know, we're just the lucky population that gets to do all of those things a little bit more often. Thank you, Brady, Sandra, and Chandel for discussing these important topics today and sharing some of your wisdom with, with us all. Um, now it's time for us to connect with one another and ask your questions directly to our panel members or peers. Um, we are going to be uh, breaking into small groups and then coming back together again as a group. You will soon see a prompt to join a breakout room. Please accept the prompt and we'll get started. Um, if you require mm. French interpretation, uh, please remain in the main room and do not accept the breakout rooms. So just, sorry, Mia, um, I think we'll just stay all in the main room because we're a smaller group today. Oh, okay. No problem. Um, and we could probably just um, put everyone on the screen. And if people, mm -hmm. because we're a smaller group, we could probably even just unmute ourselves um, and ask any questions and just have a, a whole room discussion. Yeah. And for those of you who are here with us, like, feel free to turn your camera on if you're comfortable. You obviously don't have to turn your camera on. You can use the Zoom feature to raise your hand if you would like to speak. You could also type in the chat. So if you've got a question or you want some extra clarification, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, don't be shy. Clearly, we're not shy people here. So any questions? Anybody want to ask something? or comments or share something from their own perspective that maybe mm -hmm. we didn't touch on that you have your own different experience or strategies or anything like that. Yeah, maybe something that's helped you when it uh, comes to talking to other people. Um, so share with your peers, has there been anything that's helped you that maybe we haven't said that could help other people? Cause you guys are the experts. You're living right now with IBD at your age, right? And then I think we do have a question that came in from um, when you registered that was around, 
Do you have any advice for youth with IBD that are transitioning from adolescence into young adulthood? Brady, do you, I mean, I think you're going through that right now. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Like I, um, for me, it's definitely, it is definitely easier be, just because I am transitioning to my mom's GI and we know, we know him very well. And it's like a smooth process and we know we, we've been going through it for a while. Um, but I would say try to get it done um, faster and start looking at um, different um, different GIs or if you're going on to, if you're moving in post-secondary, find out um, what you're going to do in terms of that. If you're going to find a GI in your hometown or if you're going to find one in wherever you're moving. Um, yeah, and like I, because I'm, um, I'm transitioning early, like six months early. So I got, I can't say much, but when I went um, to start talking about them, um, about it with um, the childcare, I, I forget exactly what they're called, the, uh, the uh, people who helped in the transition last year, um, they said that you need to do it sooner than later because nothing, there's nothing that sucks more than, um, than changing um last second and then you don't know um exactly what it um you don't know exactly what's going to happen especially with your medications because i don't know about other provinces but in alberta they want to swap all biologics to biosimilars and um it was a whole thing trying to figure out if they were um trying to make sure they keep me on a biologic so um i would try um, I would try your hardest to um, figure out your plan as soon as possible in order um, in order for you to fully understand what you want to do. And, Mia, yeah. were you were you wanting to? Were, did you want to add to that? I saw you put your hand up. Did you want to share some of your own experience? Um, well, of course. Um... I'm still in high school. I'm not done yet, but um, I have seven months left. It's crazy how time flies by. But um, I'd say that it's really, as you all said before, really talking about it, being comfortable with everything that is going on with your body, your mental health too is very important to take care of. And I'd say um, surrounding yourself with good people around you uh, to be sure that you have a good, like, support um and i think that everything will go fine with that <laughs> um well i have a question for you um when you were diagnosed in the past years actually what is the main symptom that you have experienced and like the biggest one that have maybe um been a little harder to deal with and what did you do to help the symptom to get away or maybe what are you doing now to live life with it? That's a really good question, Mia. Um, for me, my biggest symptom um, in the last 14 years, not even just in the last few years, my biggest symptom has been just um, dealing with pain in general. Um, it actually hasn't been the bathroom. That hasn't been, uh, it's been a symptom, of course, but it's not been my biggest symptom. So my biggest symptom has been, you know, dealing with pain and then, you know, sometimes that pain just doesn't go away and you have to handle it. So for me, I do, um, I do a lot of things like uh, for me, I love music. So when I'm not uh, feeling well, when I'm really struggling with pain, I like to turn music on. I like to take a hot shower or a hot bath. Um, I also use a diffuser. I love the smell of lavender. And I actually have, I actually have one here. Uh, I'm not, that there's no smoke in my house. It's a diffuser. So I put a, a diffuser on that has some lavender and I hope I, you know, that helps me to feel more relaxed. When I'm in a lot of pain, I like to be warm. So I have a very fluffy blanket uh, that is with me wherever I go. If I go on a trip, the blanket is coming with me. Um, I like to talk to people when I'm not feeling well. Sometimes if, you know, calling a friend or for me speaking to my husband or my mom or my dad, that's also been really helpful as well. Having a nice cup of tea. Um, 
And sometimes, depending on my pain, doing a little bit of exercise, going for a walk, or I love to play volleyball. So I'll, you know, maybe just volley the ball around in the, you know, in my house. I find that when I'm in a lot of pain, you know, if I can't get rid of it and if I, I you know, trying to um, kind of like distract myself, give myself something to do to help make me uh, relax a little bit, because I find that when I have physical pain, if I start to get stressed or anxious in my head, I feel like my pain gets worse. So I always try to help out with my brain to help my pain feel a little bit better. But my biggest symptom for sure has been, has been pain, hasn't actually been what you think would be the bathroom. Uh, so I would say uh, very similar to Chantel early on in my journey. It was definitely, well, it was both actually. <laughs> it was both. It was pain and um major urgency. I had to know where bathrooms were all the time. I was going to the washroom 30 times a day, um, waking up every hour of the night to go to the washroom. Um, the pain was actually very much correlated with urgency. A lot of times I get severe pain and then also meaning that I needed a washroom within seconds or minutes kind of thing. Um, and so I had a similar coping strategies, I would say definitely, uh, the heat thing is a thing. So whether it's a hot water bottle type of thing or a heating pad, um, bath, um, uh, you know, Netflix, like anything, again, it's like, if you could find things to help distract, um, that's great. Um, the, for me, uh, pain has really dramatically gone away since I had my uh, surgery when I was 26 and have a permanent ileostomy. Um, that's changed a lot, but now I deal with very high output, um, uh, ileostomy. So I, I do also, you know, have to rehydrate and, um, slow my bowels down with medication. And so I have a bunch of different strategies. And so, as you heard earlier, I like to spend time in the outdoors. So I have to really pay attention and managing, um, that high output, and, um, you know, uh, as, when you have an eye, high output ileostomy, it also means you're losing a lot of electrolytes. And so you have to replenish and make sure you kind of drink and get the sodium and potassium and all of those things that you're losing more so than the regular person, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think now, um, and I, I would actually say one of the hard things to deal with is always readjusting to those new normals whatever that is or what you're going through at that point of time with your disease, um, because you get used to something and we're actually human beings are amazingly resilient and can really adjust well to many different things. And then sort of getting into a new thing that you're having to deal with and sort of readjusting to that. So I think that's been a hard hard thing, but yeah. So for me, it's managing, uh, diarrhea and, um, and the, the hydration around that. And I feel like I'm a machine often where I'm just input, output, input, output. So I eat more than normal. I eat more frequently. I drink lots. Um, I use medications to slow my bowel down and all of these things to really help manage that. Um, and a lot of that is from having multiple surgeries, um, because I've had severe active Crohn's disease and had to have gone in and remove sections of my bowel. Um, so Brady, I'll pass it over to you. Cause we're like, I think we're almost out of time. Sorry. Yeah. Brady, there's a question in the chat. It says, do you have any advice for coping with the stress of IVD symptoms? Did you, did you have yeah. any advice, yeah. not necessarily coping with the symptoms, but just the stress of knowing their symptoms? Yeah. Uh, so for me, I, like I tended to just my coping mechanism for at least for Crohn's was to just try and ignore it completely or just um kind of hide like like um I I tended to like try and hide hide the symptoms or just not talk about like if my stomach is really bothering me, but I'm at a friend's house and I, and like, I, I start to stress out a little bit, um, just because I'm like, oh God, like, I don't want to go to the washroom in their house because as, uh, as, uh, as Sandra was saying, but like going to the washroom, like, oh, I'll stink up the whole house or whatever. But it's like, um, it's like, hmm. 
I want, um, I try to um, just, um, a way to cope with all the anxiety was just not really think about it. And I just thought about being with my friends and, um, or being with my family or um, wherever I am or playing my sports. And I just, I tended to not think about it. Just think about the, um, think about the happier things um, because, um, and that's what always got me through. Um, that's what always got me through like Crohn's and the stress and all that. And that's why I'm just happy and I'm so open with it because I know that I can do, um, that I can do anything with it and then I can, that I can deal with it all. And, um, yeah. I think yeah. something that's really important to you guys is when, you know, you know, there's been a stigma around mental health and it's very important to know that when you have a chronic disease that has symptoms, this can be very hard to manage mentally. This It's a hard disease on our body and on, on our mind. And I just want to stress that it is very important that you talk to your doctors, the people in your life, your, your, your family, your friends about even talking to someone like a psychologist or a psych, you know, a psychologist who's really focused on helping you deal with these things because it's hard. It's not easy. And we do a really good job about going to the doctor when we physically feel sick, but not always the best of job when our mind is feeling overwhelmed and stressed and anxious. And I'm just going to leave you with one thing before we go. There is a doctor in Toronto, if anybody's in Toronto, um, but even if you're not, it's okay. Her name is Dr. Sarah Ahola Kahut, and she's been on Crohn's and Colitis Canada's webinars before, and she is a pediatric psychologist. And she has a fantastic video that she narr uh, narrates on YouTube, and I'll put the link um, in the chat and her whole message. So she deals with working with teens and children who have IBD and how to help manage their stress and their feelings. And the main message that she has is, and it's the title of the video is that you are not your thoughts. So she really focuses on mindfulness medit meditation um, and really just trying to live in the moment. And I really encourage you if you're struggling with dealing with your symptoms and just being stressed and anxious about that, to not only see your GI and your doctor about your physical health, but see a doctor about your mental health as well. So I'm just going to put that video in the chat. It's one of my favorite videos. I show it to my students every year, sometimes like five times a year. Okay. So especially when you're feeling uh, really stressful. Be kind to yourselves. Thank you all for sharing with this with the group. Uh, it is great to hear about all the insightful conversations taking place. Um, before we wrap up, uh, please ask any final questions in the panel uh, to the panel if you have any. Okay. Um, as we begin to wrap up today's event, I'd like to thank all of our panel members, Chantal, Sandra, and Brady for spending time with us today and to share the experiences, um, advice, and guidance. We greatly appreciate your involvement. I am so sorry. <laughs> I hope that's not your fire alarm, meaning you need to leave. No, I can continue. Uh, Wait, no, I can continue. It's, Cindy. it's okay. Uh, I'd like to thank all the wonderful everybody for joining us as well. Uh, we'd love to see you next Sunday at our event on November 21st. And we get dig more into diet and nutrition. And a huge thank you to Evan and Mia for taking part in today's event. And a huge thank you as well to the today's panelists, Chantal, Sandra, and Brady. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your experiences and your knowledge. And please let us know how we did today. Your feedback is really important to us and it'll help us plan for future events for youth, young adults, and caregivers affected by IBD. So please take 60 seconds at the end of the presentation to provide your feedback, a prompt will appear on your screen directly after this event to complete the survey. So thank you again to BG Communications for offering free online, free live French interpretation for the for Jacqueline Fisher Education Symposium series. And thank you as well to the Jacqueline Fisher Foundation for your support and for your generosity. And finally, you could follow us and stay tuned for upcoming events on our social media at Get Gutsy. And then again, thank you all. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, a great rest of your day. And if you have any questions at all or require support, please contact us at learn at Crohn's and Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your day. Bye for now. <laughs>